really cared much about in this part of the country. If you talk about xeriscaping, we were always talking about the American Southwest and Southern California, you know, real desert areas. Um, but it applies here as well. Um, but yeah, I just, it's a very timely time to be talking about xeriscaping because it is dry. Uh, Joanne and I were talking about that this morning. We were just having a little talk here. I take the train back and forth to work every day and I spend a lot of time looking out the window on the train and I spend a lot of time looking as I'm walking back and forth from the train station to the Gardner Center and plants are starting to hurt right now. Um, it's getting really dry. I'm even starting to notice larger, more mature, more mature trees that are starting to wilt now and when the big trees start wilting, that's that's trouble because that means the, the, the groundwater is starting to get low too. So. We definitely need some rain and not just thunderstorms. We need some, uh, we need it to rain for three or four days. It's like cloudy, misty, steady rain for, nobody likes days like that, but we, we really could use that right about now. So, you know, the, the whole concept of xeriscaping is really started in the southwestern part of the United States. And it's a way of life there. Um, it's really not something, or a way of life for many now. You know, years ago, if you moved out to Arizona or Southern California and you could afford irrigation and you could afford to water your landscape twice a day, that was the thing that you just did. Um, but it's become such an issue in the West where it's, you can't water, even if you have means to water now, you, most towns or states won't let you use water like that anymore. I know we were just talking this morning. I don't live in Fairfield County, but I, I believe Aquarian has made that, um, you can only use your sprinklers twice a week, permanent and mandatory. And, you know, in years when we have a lot of water, like I think that was in place last year as well. And last year we had crazy amounts of rain during the summer. We had a couple of flooding events last summer. Um, there was lots of water last year and those remained in place. And it's actually smart on their part because Number one, it is conserving billions of gallons of water, but watering your plants deeply twice a week is actually a much better way to water your plants for the overall health of your plants. So watering your plants lightly every day just encourages shallow spreading roots. Um, my mother is notorious for this. My mother loves to water her plants in her perennial garden for five minutes every day. And it's just the, it's the exact opposite of what you want to do. You really want those plants to have to, to reach, um, to reach for, for their water. But what I'm going to talk about today, you know, the whole concept of xeriscaping is really based on a few principles. You know, it's choosing, um, it's choosing water-wise plants. It's um, planning and designing responsibly so that you're not combining really thirsty plants with plants that don't need a lot of water. It's about improving your soil. It's about maintaining your landscape. It's about using mulch effectively. And it is about, um, you know, watering responsibly and correctly. So that's a lot of things to talk about. So what I'd like to focus on today, number one, it's my area of expertise. I definitely want to talk about water-wise plants for sure. And then I do want to talk a little bit more about watering responsibly and a little bit about mulch, because um, those are two things. You know, we don't live in a desert here. Um, we live in a temperate wet climate. We usually get about 44 to 48 inches of rain in Connecticut every year. And that's spread out over 12 months. Um, we don't have wet seasons and dry seasons, so we don't have to grow proper cactuses here, that sort of thing. We can, we can have these temperate climate plants. But I have a lot of, um, I have a lot of different water-wise plants here to tell you specifically about. And then I also have a few notorious not water-wise plants over here on the floor because I, I kind of want to leave you guys today with a tool that you can use to figure out if a plant is drought tolerant or not just by looking at it. Even if you don't know what it is or whether it's an annual or perennial, um, plants give us a little clue as to whether or not they're thirsty plants or, or um, water-wise plants. I'm going to explain that a little bit for you today too. But I brought over bunch guys here. Um, these are all herbaceous perennials. I didn't bring any shrubs with me today. A, I think we have a what, 45 minute talk today, so I try to li you know, limit it to perennials today. 
Um, these are all herbaceous perennials that are going to die back every year and disappear in your landscape. So no presence in the winter time. Um, so that's where I want to spend my focus today. There are both native plants here and non-native plants on the table. Um, if you're thinking about growing water-wise plants, it is always smart to use native plants. Um, native plants are automatically going to be more suited for drought. What you have to keep in mind though when you're looking at native plants is just because it's a native plant doesn't mean it's going to be drought tolerant because native plants grow in different habitats. So when you're looking at native plants and a good gardening book, the internet of course today, if you're researching a native plant, you want to find out where it would grow in nature. Because a lot of plants will grow in wet spots, some will grow in open dry prairies, some will grow in wet meadows, you know, they have different, different situations where they grow. So just because it's a native doesn't automatically mean it's going to be super drought tolerant. And the other thing that's really important that I have to explain to people a lot is just because a plant is drought tolerant doesn't mean it's going to look and perform its best if you never water it. Um, it means that plant's going to survive. Um, it may look like crack by the end of August um, if, you let, if you don't water it and we go weeks and weeks and weeks without water, but it will come back next year. Um, but just because a plant is drought tolerant does not mean it's going to grow and look its best throughout the season. So watering these guys minimally, but everything here, everything that I have on this table today, I would qualify as a plant that you can use in your landscape that would be happy on their own without any supplemental irrigation from you. Until we get into a situation like we're in now. Um, if we get into a situation where we are going weeks without any kind of accumulating rain, these guys would be all would be okay with an inch of water during that week, which isn't really a lot um, if, if you're watering. So these guys would all be happy with an inch of water. So that little trick I want to tell you about before I talk about any of the plants specifically is picking out the drought tolerant ones. Even the drought, Joanne and I were talking about this mountain mint over here, and mountain mints come in many shapes and sizes and forms because they grow in different places. Some like to grow in wet places, most mints typically do. Um, this one happens to like to grow in a dry place. And a clue you can take from looking at your plants as to whether they're drought tolerant or thirsty is with their foliage. Um, I have a Bernera over here. Does that, anybody know Bernera? Classic um, shade plant. And then over here I have, everybody knows what a hosta is. And then I have a fern over here as well. And can anybody see the obvious difference between these, these thirsty plants and these kind of drought tolerant plants over here? What's that? Big leaf. Um, big leaf, yes, but more importantly is, is small leaves on these guys. Um, small leaves, um, strappy leaves, and in the case of the sedum over here, which is an actual succulent, just big, thick, fleshy leaves. Um, we, of course, perspire through the pores in our body. Plants transpire through the pores in their leaves. So the bigger the leaf surface of a plant, the more opportunity there is for water loss. Transpiration is kind of how they breathe, you know, the CO2 in, the oxygen out, part of photosynthesis. But the bigger the leaf surface, the more opportunity for water to be lost. So that's why so many drought tolerant plants have evolved with these little tiny narrow leaves, like these guys over here. Another classic leaf of a um, of a drought tolerant plant are thin strappy leaves like this, which are you know classic on grasses and things like that. The Achillea over here, another great example. The yarrow. Very fine ferny leaves. Again, smaller leaf surface, left less opportunity for moisture loss. Um, so is that 100% correct every time? No, but it's probably 80 or 85% correct. You can just kind of glance 
at a plant and know whether or not it wants to be in the sun or the shade, even or wet or dry. Even if you're buying annuals, I mean, if you think about begonias, caladiums, you know, all all those shade annuals always have big or fleshy leaves. Yeah. I was just about to bring that up about annuals versus perennials. Yeah. Do you find that annuals have less drought tolerance than perennials? I mean, in terms of root structure. Annual, there are not many annuals that I would consider like drought tolerant, with the exception of like some things like portulacas, geraniums, which are actually succulents. Um, geraniums are really, really drought tolerant. And, but geraniums are one of those things that can go a long time without water, but they'll abort their flowers, they'll drop their leaves, and then if you start watering them again, they'll regrow. But they won't look their best all summer long if you just neglect to water them at all. Yeah, I was thinking about you know those, those big um, uh, planters that they have in town. You know that they're all annuals, I'm assuming, and some of them they look kind of a little sad now. They look they're, terrible. Yeah, I walk by them every morning. They, and I know that yeah. they're trying to water them. I mean, so Jamie was out there this morning watering yeah, them. Yeah, I see them every morning. Them, yeah. And yep. It just seems like they don't have that ability to. Even yeah. Like with that concept, they water them almost every day. I think. He does water them every morning. So, yeah. And they still kind of look yeah. pretty rough. And that's what happens. You know, you put them in a, they're fine at the beginning, but as they get bigger and their roots occupy the soil in the, in the pot, you know, you reach a point where there's more roots than soil, and then you couple that with this endless sunny hot day, hot after hot day after hot day, and that's, and that's what happens. They just kind of, they fry out. And the first thing that goes is the flowers, and then the leaves go after that. Yeah, so it's just, it, it's tough. But yeah, everybody, the, the, the drought tolerant handle or annual is like the golden egg. I mean, if somebody could invent that, that would be, that would be a good thing because everybody wants annuals or hand baskets that they don't have to water. But um, that is, um, that just, unfortunately, it just doesn't exist. It's just, it's just not a thing right now. But I do have some natives and some non-native plants here. Like I said, if you're dealing with natives, you want to make sure that they're natives that are from a dry environment or dry habitat um, to make them work. Um, grasses, all the grasses are, are um, drought tolerant. Um, these prairie grasses, I have uh, this panicum here, this is a shrinkium over here. Those are both Connecticut natives. Um, Connecticut natives are ideal if you're xeriscaping. Um, you can certainly do with Midwestern natives as well. But if you're really trying to um, keep it authentic, the Connecticut natives are certainly certainly your way to go. Um, so the grasses grasses are almost always drought tolerant, and again they may brown out. You know they may brown out midsummer. That's what they do. A lot of times grasses the tips will turn brown, but they'll be fine next year. Um, this is a not a not a grass, but a lot of people think it is. This is a, a liriope. I tend to tend to lump these in with a group of plants that I call uh, gas station plants. <laughs> um, the liriope, um, this, this guy over here too, I tend to consider a gas station plant. That's a day, uh, happy returns daylily. But there's a reason you see daylilies in liriope and gas stations in commercial places, because they're really drop tolerant. Um, they will go for a great, long, great length of time without supplemental irrigation. And even if they do dry out to the point that their leaves turn completely brown and fall off and they're gone in the middle of August, um, they'll come back next year. Um, so they're, they're tough plants, um, but they just won't, they won't look pristine without a little extra water from you. So those are, those are two, two of my gas station guys there. Um, sedum, I mentioned this one a little earlier. Sedum's an actual true succulent that I have on the table. Does anybody have sedum at home of some kind? Almost everybody always has sedum. Um, this one's called Autumn Fire. Um, the, the standard in the industry for years was Autumn Joy. Um, Autumn, this is an improved Autumn Joy. Autumn Joy has a tendency to kind of flop over, over and open up and fall over the ground late in the season. Um, Autumn Fire is an improved Autumn Joy, so that's a really good sedum. Not a native plant. This you could definitely plant and not have to ever water. That would be even during drought times. These are these are super, super hardy. And um, not a native plant, but the um, butterflies love them. And they're a really important source of color at the end of the season. You know, they color up the end of August, September, October, that time of year. A couple other cool guys here. Another scrappy one here. Again, not a native. This is an allium called Summer Beauty. 
Anybody grow an owl at home? You are an owl at home. Um, think chives. Um, same family as chives, uh, garlic. So this could be, it's an allium, you could call it an ornamental onion. These guys are, again, not a native, not this particular one. Um, Midsummer bloomer, super duper drought tolerant. Again, you wouldn't have to give that any extra water. In fact, extra water is usually curtains for, for allium. Yeah? Could you use that in a culinary sense? No. Okay. These are strictly for looking at. Yeah. Um, both both flowers and and the foliage. So those are just for just for um, just for admiring, not eating, for sure. Um, but if you, if anybody's ever grown chives, the flowers are very similar. They're just smaller, and that's true of um, true of most of the onions there. And a few other ones here. Um, another one that most people may grow. Maybe most of you have killed this one at one point or another. Is lavender. Uh, lavender is a classic choice for. A dry xeriscape. Um, again, thin, scrappy leaves. Lavenders are definitely not native. Um, lavenders come from a from the Mediterranean area. Has anybody grown lavender or growing lavender? Are you growing yours successfully? No, I killed it. Okay. <laughs> Do you have it? Yeah. Is it happy? I it in a uh, rocky, stony uh, crop with very little water. Yeah. And I exclude from seeds. So yeah. I feel like it's very resilient yep. because it's been there for a while. Yeah. And it, the, the deer don't touch it and they just take care of themselves. It's a great plant. We sell more of them than any other perennial we carry. Um, I believe probably because 90% of them are people replacing the ones they bought the year before they died. <laughs> um, so I think it's one of the reasons they're so popular. Um, what I tell people about lavender all the time is number one, you have to, when you're planting it, you have to think about the Mediterranean. You have to think about Spain. You have to think about Italy. You have to think about the south of France. Um, lavender enjoys water just as much as any other plant, but they don't like to be wet. Um, you can water your lavender every day if you want to, but the water has to leave the root zone after you water it. They won't sit in water or the, a, a soil that stays moist day after day like most other plants would love. It is instant death for lavender. Uh, lavender People, a lot of plants people struggle with and they die over the winter or during the summer months. Lavender dies 12 months of the year. Um, it dies It dies for reasons in the summer and reasons in the winter and that reason is always the soil is too wet um, and it doesn't drain well. They like a lot of open space so like you said, rocky, gravelly, sandy. Um, your lavender will be happy as a clam. They are super drought tolerant. They're super cold hardy. A lot of people think their lavender is dying in the winter because it's cold, but it's not. It's the soil. is It's those thaws we get in the winter time where the soil is just wet and muddy for a few days in January, and then it gets cold again. That's what does them in. But lavender, if you can get the soil right, lavender is probably one of the better plants on this table for, for xeriscaping. Um, it is just really... You don't have to do anything to it. It's just really, it's really a great plant. And Joanne and I were talking earlier about the deer and the rabbits and the bunnies. That's one of the few plants on the table that I've never seen the three of those animals eat. Um, lavender is almost always resistant to all the animals. Yeah. Um, would you amend your search? Let's say you had a uh, clay-based soil. Would yep. you recommend like a cactus soil amending with that, or just sand, or? So the way the way lavenders like it to be is they like a soil that's about forty-five percent mineral content. So that could be clay, sand, silica, you know that sort of thing. They only like about five percent organic matter, and then the other fifty percent. They want it to be open pores. So in other words, gravel, um, lava stone, you know, that sort of thing. So even if you were to use cactus soil, you'd still want to mix in some chunky pebbles or that sort of thing. They really want that open space in their root zone. Yeah. So when you plant them, they don't have incredibly deep roots. So if you when you plant them, you can put up you can dig their hole a little deeper and put some gravel even at the bottom, like you would if you were planting a cactus in a pot or something like that and then mix your sandy, minerally soil with some other gravel and, and fill in with that. That's, the, um, that's really the, the trick with them. Another one that's really similar right next to, and obviously not a native, is Perovskia here. This is 
Russian Sage. Anybody grow Russian Sage? Russian Sage is another one. As far as drought tolerance, this is a, a great one. Um, this plant will not need any extra water from you at all. And a lot of times, as in the case with the lavender, extra water from you will kill them. Um, the Russian sage really likes to be dry. I found that it's the structure of it, it just kind of, it just kind of, I don't think it's as nice as the lavender. It gets baked and it gets like, it falls over a little bit. It's absolutely true. So that's the plain old Russian sage, Porovskia, Atropofolia, that's been around for years. Um, you will see all sorts of new ones now. This one here is called Little Spire, which kind of solves that problem a little bit because most of them grow about four feet tall. Uh, Little Spire here only grows to 30 inches tall. And there's also another one, Crazy Blue, and there's also Rocket Man and Blue Jean Baby, which are even smaller. So the plant breeders are working on making them smaller and to also eliminate that flop. Can you just cut it? Can you just like do a big chop on it and will it grow back? And so they are, good question. Um, so they are different than we talked about earlier about the herbaceous perennials that all die back and disappear completely in the wintertime. The Russian sage is a little more similar to the lavender. Whereas the lavender does not die back to the ground and disappear in the winter, this stays. Um, it keeps its foliage during the winter time. The Russian sage, you can kind of see it a little bit on this one. It gets kind of woody and you can see almost like bark down there. So if you've ever grown like a butterfly bush, um, this you will treat more like a butterfly bush or, a, or maybe a, like a PG hydrangea or that sort of thing, or even roses. So. You don't cut them back to the ground, you kind of cut them back and leave some of that chunky woody structure in the, in the, in the fall or the spring when you cut them back, but never to never fall the way down to the ground. You want to kind of leave that, um, that base there. Does it lose the leaves in the winter? After you, like when you do that? It, the, here, yes. I mean, you could theoretically leave it for the winter and it'll keep the leaves like that. They won't be viable or nice in the springtime, but it will maintain a presence over the winter like that, and then you can cut it back in the springtime. Um, the only reason I don't like to do that is sometimes if you do that and we get a heavy wet snow, it can kind of crush them and, and then kind of break the base of it. So I usually like to cut them back in the fall, or at least, you know, in mid mid-summer or so around Christmas time. Many other good ones here. Um, We'll talk about the we'll talk about the milkweed. Yeah. I lavender. Yeah. So when should we cut it? So the lavender, best thing to do with the lavender is to let it bloom. You know, they usually bloom June, July, August, sometimes into September. And then usually later on in the fall, October, cut it back, you know, just to trim it and to make it shapely. Um, not all the way to the ground. Um, just you want to remove the flower spikes, and you could do it. You could almost do it as if you were trimming a boxwood or something like that, just to neaten up and just to, and just to kind of and just to kind of round it. But you never you never cut it to the ground, and then and you don't want to cut it back too hard late in the summer because a lot of times if you do that, it'll force new growth out of it in September, and then by the time we get a frost in the fall, that growth hasn't had a chance to harden off, and it will just it will burn. It'll, it'll get I hurt by the frost. The flower turns brown, and then I cut it and collect the seeds. Like you could take the seeds, put them in a paper bag. Yeah, absolutely. And then you could not grow them where you want. Absolutely. They're actually relatively easy from seed. You said yeah. you've done this from seed. Yeah, they're, they're relatively easy. So, like, no, it wouldn't be later than August. I would say, you know, like late August, early fall. Yeah. You just, when they turn brown, you just cut them. Yep. Or, and you just take a paper bag and just go like this. Shake them in. Shake them in. Yeah. And then sometimes I tie whatever's left in. And it's a little yeah. smelly things. Of course, yeah, around the house. Yeah. And then it stays neat and tidy for the rest of the season. Yeah. Um, I have a milkweed here. You know, we talked earlier about the mountain mint, and now there's mints that like hot and mints that like, or mints that like wet and mints that like dry. Um, Aschlepius uh, tuberosa here, this is a uh, butterfly weed. Um, this is the one with the orange flower. Anyone grow milkweed? Couple milkweeds. Um, so your butterfly weed, the tuberosa, likes hot, dry, sunny. So prime candidate for xeriscaping. Swamp milkweed, as its name would imply, 
that wants a wet spot. So this one is fantastic. And again, perfect for zero escaping, perfect for a no water from you at all situation. Even in a drought situation like we're having right now, these guys are perfectly happy in those conditions. Um, these guys are native to Connecticut, native to most of the country actually. I think there's only three or four states that this plant isn't native. And it typically grows, in Connecticut, you'd find it typically growing near the shore. Um, it's kind of in that area where the ocean meets the land, the sand transitions into, we transition from the dunes into the uh, a marshland. So they like that sandy, kind of duny, dry kind of climate or environment. So that is the, the milkweed. We talked about this guy. Another good one over here. I hope lots of people are growing some kind of agastache. Does anybody have agastache at home? Okay. All right. Awesome. So. They are. They're everywhere. But they, they're great. They are great. Um, definitely on my top five list of favorite perennials um, for a lot of different reasons. The main reason being there isn't another perennial that flowers for as long as these do. Um, when people shop for perennials, everybody wants perennials that are going to bloom for months and months and months. The perennials just don't do that. It's not their nature. Perennials typically bloom for a part of the spring or a part of the summer or a part of the fall. These guys, Agastache, Anis Hyssop is, its, is a common name. Uh, hummingbird Mint is another, humming, Hummingbird Mint is another common name for this guy. Um, these guys typically start blooming in mid-June and they go all the way until October. And number so number one, that's a thing. Um, perennials don't typically flower that that long. Number two, I hate perennials that flop. I hate perennials that you need to use cages. I hate perennials that need stakes. And there's a lot of pretty plants out there that I just won't involve myself with because I don't want to get involved with staking or cages. Um, the agastache, even the tall ones, stand up straight on their own. Um, they have, a, you know, they're, they're just nice and strong. They are also in the mint family, um, a mint that likes a dry situation. And has a very strong licorice or anise scent to the foliage when you, when you, when you rub it. And that makes it deer resistant for sure. I'm pretty sure it's also rabbit and groundhog resistant. Have you cooked her? Yes. You was, yeah, they're yeah. not touching it. Yeah, nobody, nobody touches these guys. And the same thing years ago, Blue Fortune was the one that you could buy. And Blue Fortune is a nice plant. Blue Fortune gets really big. Blue Fortune gets three to four feet tall, three to four feet wide. Blue Fortune can also tend to be, tend to be floppy. Um, this happens to be Blue Fortune here. And what are they saying in here? See, they're saying, if you guys don't know this already, most of your... Whenever you see plant tags on a plant, they're always they always exaggerate the size down. I don't yeah, want I, do. I don't want to use the word lie because that wouldn't be nice. But they always downplay the size by at least twelve inches. <laughs> For sure, just so you know that. <laughs> so if you see something that says it's gross thirty six inches tall, automatically assume it's going to be forty eight. Um, they just plant. People like plants to be smaller, and a, and a lot of plants will just be labeled. Okay. You can cut it back and it'll rebloom. Okay. That's a good trick with them. Um, yep, you can cut it back. They usually start to bloom mid to late June. You can go in in maybe mid to late May and cut back whatever you have at that point in half. And it will bloom probably two or three weeks later, but it'll bloom out of a plant that's probably a third the size as it would have been if you hadn't cut it. That's also a good trick for um, Monarda bee balm. If anyone grows bee balm, I love cutting bee balm back around Memorial Day in half and then letting it flush out again. And because bee balm can get a little tall, tall Does it and get a little bushier. What's that? It gets a little bushier. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah it's not so spindly. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's a that's a great one to to do that with. Um, so yeah, if you're not growing agastache, that's a winner. And again, just like I talked about with the parapsia the Russian sage, little adder, um, purple haze. There's a whole bunch of different ones of these now that have been bred to be much, much smaller in that 18 to 24 inch range. So you don't have to have gigantic um, agastache. 
And I have two more guys here. I actually do want to circle back to that mint. Um, Coreopsis, this plant's been around forever. Does anybody have a beam Coreopsis at home? Or have you seen it before? So this plant, when I first started working in the very first garden center I worked at in 1992, this plant was brand new. And it was, it was a hit. Um, Threadleaf Coreopsis, a North American native, not Connecticut native, but North American native. And again, with the very tiny, almost non-existent leaves, very, very, very drought tolerant. Um, blooms for a really long time, mid-June to usually beginning or middle of September. If you have these guys at home, um, they benefit from deadheading to rebloom. However, you don't it's not something you need to take a week off from work to do because if you wanted to sit there and do that, what I would normally do with these guys, and you're gonna, you know, you'll always sacrifice some flowers, but it's for the greater good. This is, these are one of those perennials that you just, you know, you once 80 or 90 percent of the bloom is passed, you just gather it up like this, and then just cut the whole plant right in half, and it'll take a couple of weeks. It'll flush back out. It'll bloom all over again, almost as nice as the first time. A lot of times when you do that cutback on perennials like that, they bloom a little more, but not nearly as much as the first time. These sometimes look even better the second time around if you cut them back. So Moonbeam Coreopsis is a great one. There's another one called Zagreb that's been around for probably just as long, which has a bright yellow flower as opposed to the pale yellow flower. And it's a little more upright. It's not quite as wispy and wiry as these guys over here, but that's um plant's been around for a long time. It's a good one. Still a lot of times plants come and go, but uh, Moonbeam Coreopsis has definitely been there from the beginning. Back to the uh, little mint over here. Actually I've got two guys over here I want to talk about. I skipped over. So this guy here is a mountain mint. Has anybody heard or grow mountain mint? All right, mountain mint, uh, pink nanthemum is its botanical name. There are many different species of mountain mint that occur in North America. Some like it wet, some like it dry, some like it shady, some like it sunny. Um, some of them behave like culinary mint. Has anyone ever made the mistake of planting culinary mint in the garden where it just kind of takes over the world? Um, there are mountain mints that do that. And that's good if you have a spot where you need that to happen. It's a great, great native plant to do that with. Um, this one, this one happens to be one that likes it dry, and it also happens to be behaved. It's a, it's a clumping mint, and they take um, hot sun, bloom for a really long time. This guy's just starting to bloom now. Their flowers, you know, the flowers that the mountain mints make. Are, I would call more subtle. Would you not agree? They're, you know, in, in mass they tend to have a, they they tend to have an effect. But they, you know, it's not gonna. They're not gonna stop traffic. But they are absolutely. They are every single pollinator on the planet loves mountain mint. I mean, you will have bees and butterflies and beetles and wasps and hummingbirds and moths and everything has mountain mint. And if you guys are growing mountain mint at home and you've seen the pollinators during the daytime, some night during the summer, go out with your flashlight about an hour or two after it gets dark, because that's when the night shift takes over on the mountain mint, and there's a whole different collection of insects that come out at night and that really dig the uh, mountain mint. So that's a really, that's a fun one to have in the garden, especially if you have little kids that you can drag out there with you too at night, it's, it's, it's fun. Um, Joanne was admiring this one earlier, and this is a, this plant is called Amorpha, and it's got, a com its common name is lead plant. And this is a native, it's a Connecticut native. Um, this is more of a shrubby thing. This is a plant that if you, that's definitely for xeriscaping, for sure. Um, this is a plant that if you have an area in your property where nothing will grow. It's hot, it's rocky, it's it's baking sun and weeds keep growing there and you can't, no matter what you do or plant there or put there, it doesn't work and the weeds keep coming back. 
This one is a solution to an area like that. Um, it is, a, like I said, it's a shrubby thing. So it's gonna grow, you know, three feet tall. It kinda, in a way, grows a bit like the Russian sage does. So it's kind of woody and it has a presence in the winter time, but it still looks better if you cut it back in the springtime. But it is, um, its other common name is devil shoestrings. <laughs> Um, so that's one of its other common names, and one of the reasons it was called that is, um, well, colonial farmers, I'm sure, had something to do with it, but they, um, their roots are very deep and wide and extensive, so these would be very, when farmers were, you know, working fields and this plant got in there, they would have a very hard time plowing through them, and you know, extracting the roots. So that is a great plant for xeriscaping um, or for, for a water-wise gardening because its roots can go up to 10 to 15 feet deep, which for a plant that only grows three feet tall is pretty impressive. So that is a, it is a good plant. It, this one has not started blooming yet, but they flower forever. This is another long bloomer, July through October. They get pretty um, purple, purple flower spikes, um, which, are, which are attractive. And again, I mentioned to Joanne earlier, these are really loved. I have some at the store that are blooming. And these are really loved, not so much by bees, but those little hoverflies that look like little tiny miniature bees really, really love these. And I'm convinced that they're local native hover bee, or hoverflies that are enjoying these, so I, I love seeing that. But those are, those are my, um, those are my plant selections. There's certainly more. Um, and like I said, some are native, some are not. Um, you can use both. Um, you can have native plants and non-native plants in your water-wise garden. Um, you would never want to use plants that are considered invasive or plants that are potentially invasive. There's a lot of plants, you know, we try to stay on top of that at the gardener center, um, very much so. Now there's a lot of plants that will make it onto a state's invasive list. And once a plant makes it onto a state's invasive list, nurseries are prohibited from selling them. I have quite a few plants that we used to sell lots of that we don't offer anymore. Not because they're on Connecticut's invasive list. We could still sell them if we want to. But Plants sometimes will pop up on Pennsylvania's invasive plant list or New Jersey's invasive plant list. And once I see that, I will usually kind of say, you know what, I'm going to quit while we're ahead. Fountain grass is one of the ones we just did that with recently. Um, you probably all know Hamlin or um, little bunny fountain grasses. They usually grow about eight tall. And they get the bottle brush, or the bottle brush flowers on them in August. Again, I would consider it a gas station plant because you always, almost always see them in um, in commercial situations. But I pulled the plug on them two years ago because Pennsylvania put them on their invasive plant list, and they're from China. And we have other we have other beautiful grasses that are native to Connecticut that we can create the same effect with. So why not why not just do the right thing? But yes, you can definitely mix mix native plants mix with your um with your non-native plants that are well behaved and drought tolerant and water wise. Again, you don't have to do just natives. There are a lot of people out there and I deal with it unfortunately almost every day who are so extreme in the native plant thing that they they kind of well, they'll kind of discourage you from, from doing it because it'll be like, well, if you, unless you get rid of your whole lawn and replace all your plants with Connecticut native plants, you're doing it wrong, so don't even bother. And I disagree entirely. Um, I think, number one, just like with art and music, you should plant what you like um, and, what you, and what, you, what you want. All plants that flower have some benefit to pollinators. Um, it may not be the right pollen for every single insect, but they all have a benefit for pollinators. And, you know, I think as long as everyone starts using natives, I think as long as people are taking small steps, I think a whole bunch of people taking little steps is better than a couple of people going all in. 
I mean little steps. Everybody's got to start with we got to start with little steps. And plus, you know, I know so many people, myself included, who fell in love with a specific plant, and then that turned into a lifelong love in pursuit of gardening. And the plant that I fell in love with was not a native plant, and I know somebody else in my family who received a peony as a gift 30 years ago, and that turned into a lifelong obsession with gardening. And she, during the COVID lockdown, turned 50% of her front lawn into a Connecticut native garden. But her love of gardening started with peonies that she developed a collection of over the years, but it, it led to something else better. So I think that's, for gardening, I think you need to plant what you like and let it take you, let it, let it take you places. Um, so enough with that. Um, I was also wanted to talk about watering, you know, because that's the other uh, important part of uh, is aeroscaping. I talked about my mom. A lot of people water their plants incorrectly. And watering your plants every day, and I'm not talking about plants in containers, I'm not talking about annuals. The annuals you do have to water every day. But landscape plants should never be watered every day. Even newly planted plants, a lot of people come into the store all the time with plants they're having problems with. Um, something they just bought and planted either from us or somewhere else. And you know, my first question is always, well, how often are you watering it? And a lot of times people will tell me what they think I want to hear. <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll go for the wrong, the right answer, even if, the, if, if it's not what they're doing. So nine times out of ten when I ask somebody how often they're watering their plants, they say, well, I'm watering it every day. But that's too much. It's too much water, especially for a plant you just planted in the ground, because its roots haven't even gone anywhere yet. If they're still just sitting there right in that little spot, like they were on their pot in the ground. So watering them for five minutes every day is not going to be nearly as effective as watering that plant for 15 minutes twice a week. That's the much better way to go. Water it, let it soak in. Water, soak. Avoid that the runoff like we talked about earlier. Um, so infrequent deep watering for new plants and established plants in the landscape. Um, not mixing, you know, I said, like we said, if you want to go with wise landscape, you don't have to tear up your whole yard and, and do the whole thing. You can start in places. Um, you can start in spots. I just helped a couple a couple of weeks ago who recently purchased a house with a long driveway with a mailbox at the end of it that they didn't have irrigation and they didn't want to water anything. So we came up with a nice little setup that will work for them down at the end of their driveway where they have plants now where they don't have to water ever, even during even during drought situations. So you don't have to you don't have to do the whole thing. You can start in you can start in phases. Um, but like I said, you don't want to mix thirsty with not so thirsty. And a lot of our garden plants, unfortunately, azaleas, rhododendrons, hollies, andromedas. A lot of those plants are thirsty plants. Um, a lot of our favorite landscape plants, especially the ones we use around the foundation, uh, boxwoods, all that sort of stuff. And most of those plants don't even come from North America, let alone Connecticut. Now, those plants are very, have been introduced from other, other continents, most of them from Asia. They're not invasive plants or bad plants, they're just not native. So we spend, you know, we spend a lot of time trying to create Create to create a situation for plants that doesn't exist here. You know, more water than we get. Um, you know that, that sort of thing. So you know, it just it's about mixing in and phasing out those thirsty things. Um, everybody's got azaleas and rhododendrons around the house. Almost everybody, and they're good plants. They're evergreen. They stay green year round. There's a reason we use them. I was down in um, North Carolina last summer on a Christmas tree search for the store, and I got to spend some time in and around the Great Smoky Mountain National Forest. And I saw rhododendrons growing in their native majestic glory. Has anybody ever been down there and seen them down there, rhododendrons? Um, 
a lot of our rhododendrons that we use in our landscape are native to that part of the United States. And, but it was fascinating to see these rhododendrons, which were growing wild there, because they grow in a very... And it made, as soon as I saw them, I said, this is why so many people have a hard time growing rhododendrons at home, because they grow in a very specific place and manner, and that's they grow on slopes. And some of the slopes of these mountains that they were growing on, I was kind of shocked at how steep the grade was. So imagine river or stream here with deep banks with the rhododendrons growing on the side. And I never saw them growing anywhere except for the embankments of these forests with rivers at the bottom. And I was like this, and I know rhododendrons are very susceptible to phytophthora or root rot. That's what usually kills most of them. And as soon as I saw them, I was like, this is why they fail in the landscape, because they grow on that slope. So just like the lavender we talked about, they get watered, but it kind of it runs through and goes right down into the river. So they are in a spot where they get just the, just, they get the water in the way they want it. And then we try to force them into different situations here. And you know, the same applies, you know, the same applies for a lot of these plants. Um, so we water responsibly, we water twice a week deeply, just like Aquarian wants everyone to do. And then, you know, the other thing is mulching. Does everyone use mulch? You know, that's usually a pretty common thing for people to do. Um, mulch, whether it's pine mulch or hemlock mulch or cedar mulch, if you apply it two to three inches deep, it's going to retain moisture. It's going to keep weeds out. And that's you know the, the main purpose of it is to do those two things. But the most important thing is you know people think it's because it looks nice. You can use you can cut your water consumption by eighty percent by mulching your plants and then watering and watering deeply. So mulch is certainly critical. Um, mulching around perennials, a lot of people skip mulching around perennials, but you should still mulch around your perennials as well. You just want to, you know, you don't want to bury the crown of the plant in mulch. You want to kind of taper it, taper it away from them. But they, um, they benefit from mulch as well. And you could even use, um, it could be gravel, it could be stone. You know, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a wood mulch product. It could be, um, yeah. what's that? Your leaves. Absolutely, that's what I do at home. Yeah, that's what I do. Yeah. I've had my house for 15 years and I don't even own a rake. You just take the mower, you mow it. I mow it with my mulching mower with the bag, yeah, and then just every it. leaf, and then I dump it back out. That's what I do. That's yeah. what I do. Um, it works as a mulch for the winter time, and then of course it breaks down and it's free food. It's free food. It's free food for your plants the following year. But again, these are um, these are some of my favorites for for water wise gardening. Um. I hope you guys are willing to give some a try if you haven't already. I know there's a lot of them getting tried over in this area of the room, <laughs> over in this section, but not so, but not so much, not but not so much the rest of the room. So hopefully you guys will give some a, give some of them a try if you haven't considered them yet. Um, they're they're great plants, and yeah, I think I picked some winners here today. There are certainly others I wanted to be reasonable with the amount of plants I brought over to the library. Yeah? You were, this, this variegated hosta thing. Yeah. You say that this is not, uh, it, it takes a lot of water. So hostas, so hostas will handle dry shade quite well. Yeah. yeah. They will take, handle dry shade. They won't handle dry sun. They can barely, they'll barely handle wet sun. But hostas, especially once they're established, they will definitely handle dry shade. And they'll take over. No, um, not really. Um, they're not. They're not spready. Um, they're not. I wouldn't call them misbehaved in any way. They will. They form clumps, and they live forever. Yeah. And so, and those clumps will kind of keep going and going and going. Um, but they def it's not the sort of thing you're going to find popping up in other parts of the yard or the lawn or anything. I would, the hostas are definitely well behaved, but they live for um, they live for such a long time that they will the clump will kind of spread and in the right places that you know that's good that's a value. And then just one other question: If you're going to water plants, yep. is it better in the morning at night? 
So here's the deal with that. Um, for years and years and years, everybody says, don't let your plants die it causes disease. Um, that was what I, I learned that early um, in my gardening career, that if you're going to cause disease if you water at night or in the evening. And if you're watering plants that are prone to disease, like I wouldn't go out at 7 o'clock at night and hose down my tomatoes or squash or phlox or anything that's prone to or roses. You know, I wouldn't do that. Um, if you can use soaker houses, you know, that's better than irrigation. But to be honest with you, the very best time, and it's when I water all my plants, and it's not just because I leave my house at 4.30 in the morning, um, I always water my plants in the evening, uh, 7 o'clock, 7.30, 8 o'clock, for a couple of reasons. And I'm talking about my plants in containers and plants in the ground. That I water them in the evening right before dark. Um, when you water plants during the daytime, and I live this every day at the nursery, when you water plants early morning or this time of the morning on a hot sunny day, that water gets transpired through the plant almost as quickly as you're giving it to them. Especially plants in containers. Um, if you water a plant at night as it's going, getting dark, the plant has all evening to take it, take water, get it to its stems, get it to its leaves, get it, get it where it needs to go before it starts sweating it out again in the morning. So I always like watering in the evening. Even vegetable gardens, if you can water vegetable gardens with um, so you, with soaker hoses, or if you if you can water vegetables in pots or in the garden carefully by hand, you know, and keep it off the foliage, it's a much better time to do it. Um, you know, a lot of people would also say, well, don't water at night, you're going to get slugs. Well, you know what happens? Slugs come <laughs> when it rains, too. I mean, it's just, it, it, slugs are uh, slugs. Are slugs. But evening is always better, in my personal opinion. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Can you explain to me, if we have a really, really wet spring and yes. record rainfall, a couple months later we're in the middle of a drought. I never quite understand how how the soil absorbs it so quickly that I mean there's no residue of moisture left over, you know what I mean? There's you no know, deep in the ground, there's groundwater that stays all the time, but most of our ornamental plants, you know, trees notwithstanding, you know, most of our ornamental plants, their root zones are fairly shallow. You know, they're only a couple of feet feet deep, and that water, you know, that water goes quickly. Um, it, it dries out quickly, especially in once we start getting hot weather. Now this this entire season so far has been spectacular. I think as far as the weather goes, uh, where it's the 12th of July, and I can count on one hand still. I can count on one hand the amount of nights this year I've had my air conditioning on overnight. One hand, and it's a great year for me to be saving money on in the utility budget for sure. But I have had my air conditioning on only five times this year overnight, and it's been open windows and fresh air. Um, Barely any humidity at all this year, but the trade-off apparently is no rain. So right now we could use some rain because once we start getting the hot day after hot day after hot day without rain, that that water in the in the top couple of feet of the soil just uh, dries up. It just does. It just goes. Yeah. Well, I just have two things. Yeah, of course. I the other thing that you didn't uh, mention is the prickly pear cactus. That's I wanted to bring one. I have one and it's amazing. You I wanted to bring one with me, and I meant to put one aside at the store, and somebody bought it for you. <laughs> yeah, Apuntia humafusa is a native prickly pear cactus. So when I say native, I'm talking about native to Connecticut, and it is a prickly pear cactus. You all know the cactus with the, with the pads. And that is one of the plants that fascinated me very early as a child who was in the gardening. Because we went on a family trip to Cape Cod, and I saw them growing everywhere while we were in Cape Cod, and I was fascinated about it. And this was 40 years ago <laughs> when you 
had to go to the library if you wanted to find out about anything. And I went to the library when I came back home. I used to ride my bike there, and I found out that, that cactus was actually native and grew naturally in Cape Cod, and it just blew my 11-year-old mind. And we tracked some down and planted some in my great-grandmother's perennial garden, and I've had that plant probably everywhere I've lived since there. It's just well, because the nice thing about it is you can just take the pads that, off and bring it with you. There's great. a huge stand of it at the property that the town has um, made of an offer on the Great Island. Great Island. Yeah, it's huge. It's actually quite, and it's under some shade. It's interesting. It's dry. That's on like a rock yep. slope there. Yep. And I remember thinking, wow, I've never seen such a big grouping of yep. the cactus. They grow well in the shade, actually. Um, they do. They do well in shady spots. I have mine near my air conditioning condenser. That's it's kind of dry there. So. They're fun and they they're really nice for a couple of reasons. Number one, as you know, they have spectacular flowers. Yeah, it's beautiful. And the native bees adore them. Um, they also stick around in the wintertime. They do. Yeah. Um, they're cactus, and these are you know cactus just like you would associate with a desert. Um, in the winter, usually in October, they start drawing all the moisture out of their pads into the root zones, and the pads just kind of collapse and fall over, and they just lay there on the ground all winter, and then in the spring when it starts to warm up, they just perk back up and start growing again. The only thing, I, my, only, my only complaint about the prickly pear cactus is because they are great for sunny, hot, dry, they're great on slopes, the pads break off, they fall, they root, and they, they'll fill in a slope for you, but when the day comes, do you have to weed? Oh my god. Yeah. That's the trouble with them. You're very fun. That's the trouble with them, because you have to get in there without stepping on them and crushing them, and you always, yeah, you always end up either arm first or hopefully not face first <laughs> in, in, the, in the patch room, so yeah. They are they are tough to weed, but they are they it's a great plant. It's, and it's a Connecticut native. Um, that's a plant that we would have seen if we came here five hundred years ago, we would have seen that all over the place here in Fairfield County, because that is a very it's a Connecticut native, but particularly to the to the shoreline. You know, that's where its native range was. But yeah, great plant. My second plug is um, I have a Facebook group called Berrien Garden Exchange where we kind of exchange plants and yep. supplies and if anybody wants to join, um, seeds, uh, people's leftover, you know, if they made too many uh, vegetables. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of that. <laughs> sure. We get like eyes bigger than our, yeah. so um, if anybody's interested, there's a lot of, I mean, it's not purely native or anything, yeah. but we you know, advertise. So that's where people bring all their zucchini that they don't want. Yeah, you know what, and, <laughs> and um, my daughter's actually about to start a volunteer thing, hoping that telling people about um, person to person will take any leftover uh, garden yeah. um, things that, you know, people don't have a need to cook, and they'll give it to their, uh, their food pantry, so. Yeah, it's, during um, during 2020, during the COVID the COVID spring, during the lockdown, our herb and vegetable sales were up 900 yeah. percent over 2019. It was the craziest thing I've ever seen in my whole life. Um, I could not buy vegetables and herbs fast enough, and it wasn't just happening at the gardener center. It was happening at every garden center in the country at the same time because this was April, and within, within the blink of an eye, every vegetable grower in the country was out of plants, so I couldn't even, I was out of, it the, the, was the 18th of May, and I couldn't buy basil anymore, which is gone, like there was none to be had, and because the whole world determined they were going to grow their own food, and then <laughs> in 2021, my urban vegetable sales were down 900% over, <laughs> over 2020 because everybody decided they made a mistake. Yeah, <laughs> and they're growing, growing, and growing food at home is not nearly as easy as they thought it was going to be. <laughs> yeah, vegetables, vegetables are tough. Anybody growing vegetables at home this year? We got some vegetable gardens going. Yeah, are they going well? Yeah, are, I'm Something's having mixed, eating them. Yeah, there's I'm, a lot of eat, like. Predators and things that like to eat everything. And birds. Oh, yeah. I do a lot of berries, so they, they're having a feast. Constant challenge, yeah. They hear the raisins, everything. Yeah. They won't touch the mints, though. Oh, but that's the, yep. Yeah. Like a lot of these, they don't, they won't. Yeah, the, again, the agastache and the, the pink lanthanum over here, the mountain mints, you, I mean, those are just two. If you have animal problems, you can't go wrong with 
either of those. And there's so many different ones you can kind of mix it up a little bit. There's even um, there's even agastaches and oranges and yellows and reds if you wanted to get out of the out of the purple shades. There's some there's some good ones. Yeah. I have one last question. Of if course. You, um, if you were to recommend one or two shrubs that you didn't bring here that yep. are also drought tolerant, do you have any top two that you could think of? I do. Yep. So. One of my favorites, and I almost brought one, but I didn't want to be obnoxious. <laughs> um, one of my absolute favorites is Ilex Glabra, uh, Inkberry Holly. Right. Um, Inkberry Holly is a fantastic plant. Uh, number one, it is native to Connecticut. It will grow in the sun, it will grow in shade, it will grow in wet soil, it will grow in dry soil, it will grow in it will grow next to a body of water, but it will also grow in sand at the beach. It is just a very versatile plant. It keeps its leaves all year round. It looks a lot like a boxwood. Um, it does not produce red berries in the wintertime like a traditional Hollywood. It produces a blackberry that you don't really see. So, <laughs> but the birds love them. Um, it's a native plant, and with the exception of, I guess I'd call it an inherent flaw of the plant, they could easily replace boxwoods with the exception of the fact that they don't like to keep their foliage at the bottom. They get, they look like perfect little green meatballs when they're young in a pot, and then as they get older, they're still beautiful, but the base of them gets open and you can see kind of through underneath them. And people who like boxwoods don't like that kind of look. You know, when you're doing boxwoods, you want that kind of formal clip sort of thing. Right, but they're not, they're not the disease that boxwoods have. They don't don't, boxwoods you have. don't have to have somebody come into the house twice a month to spray your ink berry stuff. That's, yeah. that's correct. <laughs> and that stuff is pretty in the boxwoods, you know, you're spraying for the leaf miners in the spring, and then you're spraying for the boxwood blight, and then you're coming back for the leaf miners again, and then for the boxwood blight again. Yeah, a lot of boxwoods are a lot of trouble. I don't know if anyone has ever heard me say this before. I've said it a million times in, during seminars. I, even though I sell a lot of boxwoods and I, I respect them as, as a plant, um, they should really stay south of the Mason-Dixon line. I hate boxwoods in the north for so many different reasons, um, especially when people wrap them up in burlap in the wintertime. It just drives me crazy. It drives me crazy. You know, you get to see it. I, I call them uh, boxwood sausages. Um, when you have like a, an $8 million house with these burlap boxwood snakes running through the the front yard for five months of the year. I'm always like, why do you want to do that? There's so many better plants <laughs> that you don't have to wrap up and spray and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But yeah, I digress. Any other any other general boxwood questions or general gardening questions? I should say. All right, well, thanks, guys. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And like I said, there's lots of other you know lots of other xeriscaping choices and yeah check them out and what's really nice if I could just circle back real quick um, like I said at the beginning 30 years ago when you talked about xeriscaping you would automatically come up with resources talking about California and Las Vegas and, and Phoenix you know right now there are if you hop online you can find very relevant current Connecticut xeriscaping information. There's a couple folks in Connecticut that are really into it and do a good job with it. So I encourage you to check them out. Thanks again, guys.